Hi, folks. Welcome to Monday's I Write Radio podcast. We've got Jimmy Hutton with us. Hi, Jimmy. How do you, mate? And Stuart Lockhead. Stuart. Hello. Hello there. And I'm Norrie Stuart. We're going to kick off with the presser. Um, and I think there'll be a couple of wee offsides come from that. And the George Caravan piece in the National. Yes, it was in the National. Um, regarding the indie list parties and what they think is happening with that. Uh, Stuart, you saw the presser. Yes, um, I was bouncing. I went and had a quick look at, at um, BBC One rather than BBC Scotland at the time of switchover. I assumed, though, that you'd be watching that part of it. I actually didn't today. So oh, I, don't just... know, I don't know who got the SMP bad spot today. Dross. Oh, right. And he was standing in a very wet, <laughs> on the green outside Westminster, getting very wet. I chuckled at that. And the sound, because you know what the traffic sounds like on a wet road, there's a lot more tra- uh, uh, tyre noise. So, it, it, just out of interest, did he mention his idea of a seven-day consultation? That was the only topic that came up here. I didn't wait to find out. Does he understand it. how this pandemic works? It works like this. If you have a delay, you have more deaths. So it's lives versus uh, a committee deciding when to take action. Well, it's between seven and nine days to double. Yep. So it's a 9% increase a day, I think, was said at the presser. So the the first minister, when she was asked about, uh, um, he must have trailed it before he went live on, because she was busy talking. She knew something about it. Um, She rubbished it because of that. You know, it is a question, if you delay, there's more deaths. Yes, it would like to have everybody aboard. And then she wheeled out Gregor, the, the chief medical officer, and he uh, laid it on the line. It's more dead. Yeah. Oh, well. I noticed the Herald had a pop as well, tried to bring the salmon thing into it. And she gave him short shift. Yes, it didn't. She didn't get very far. The, there was the quote, of course, which was quite good, actually. That, that I'm not quite sure who it was good for. What was the quote? Oh, yes. The questioner asked that, she, that suggested that she showed elevated stress. Well, she threw that back at. <laughs> when, when she answered the question, she threw, threw, threw that back at them. I don't think I'm going to show elevated stress here. I think she did, but she threw threw back that threw that quote back. Um, she dealt with it. She knew what she was saying. She did say, uh, I think her, the confessional bit in the answer to that question was, well, I can't control the questions on TV. Un- unlike, I believe, one of the arguments that uh, Newsnight's having with the government is they want their the questions published to them before they're asked. So they don't want to be caught off guard. That is hearsay, folks. I don't have any proof of that. Just as an aside, we're getting our first um, Downing Street press conference at six o'clock live tonight after Boris's announcement. Allegra will be making her debut. Oh, right. This is the uh, White House move Mm -hmm. where you have a press secretary put up to tell lies to the press on your behalf. Mm, Basically, yes. I look forward to seeing who the SNP pick. I'm curious to find out just what the the downside of that will be. I don't mean from our point of view, but from their point of view. I'm sure there's going to be reasons why you shouldn't do that, but we'll find out, eh? Well, Well, the the main downside for the Tories is going to be, actually, probably none. The main downside will be for the press, because Allegra Stratton's going to show herself up as a complete died in the wool Tory. And then anybody that's ever worked with her will be considered the same. Yeah. Um, And remember, the White House pulled the press conferences, um, turned them into statements. So essentially, she started, the I can't remember the lassie's name, but she stood up, made a statement and wouldn't take questions. But bear in mind, that that, that press spokeswoman, it's always been a woman, I think, for... for, uh, Trump, was it? Anyway, generally a good-looking woman. Um, but he's had a few. Oh, aye, he's run through them. <laughs> he's run through them. Sorry. You, they, you, probably, you, you, they probably find the weight of their chastity belt too heavy to carry for too long. 
I'd have thought it'd be the weight of their lives, but never mind. I think so. He's probably right. Well, there were one, one or two interesting points from the presser. The three-tier alert. We, we, we had a. Uh, we'll get more detail on that today because this is coming from London and the argument from London. And don't forget that a Cobra meeting this morning, so that all the all the devolved people were there, include and I think probably mayors of important cities. Yeah, Radio uh, Force said some of the. Uh, they'd all have been there involved. involved. Um, this three-tier alert. There is a reason for it to be aligned, but uh, the First Minister is insisting that Scotland will uh, plough its own track path. Um, well, I've, I've immediately spotted a problem with it. If the third tier is where we are now in the central belt... That's more or less it. She, she laid that out when she was asked. Uh -huh. You need a fourth tier. Back to the lockdown in the spring that we had. Well, effectively, if this doesn't work, where do you go? You shut the schools and the everything again. Well, I noticed that Fergus Ewing was employed yesterday to move the goalposts somewhat and hint that this is not for 16 days, as Nicola has promised, and that it may increase, it may also go longer. So well, the, the, quest the, the, question, the question he was asked was the usual can you guarantee? You know, and I mean... And the other one is inevitable. That you can't you guarantee have, anything. Yeah, is it inevitable that you'll have more stricter rules or something? It's the same idea. Uh, she rode back on the, the Fergus Ewing, so, uh, what, so the quote yeah, yeah. she's made. She rode back on that. Uh, I suppose the most exciting, interesting topic, which I'll finish with, uh, that she brought up right at the end, was the Christmas travel plans. Uh, she would not be let. Uh, she would not make any promises about that. She did say that your best hope for a Christmas is to get down and do as you're told now. But there's still no guarantee. But uh, it is. I want to know. I'm not going down this year again. But uh, I mean, most people want to know their, their Christmas plans now, don't they? So you can't blame them. Stuart, can you guarantee that you won't have an illness between now and Christmas? Of course not. So why should the I, government be able to guarantee where the pandemic's going to be? Right, I can't guarantee if I'll be alive at Christmas. I mean, a better question would have been, will there be options for Christmas? But even that can't be guaranteed. Well, one other thing that caught my ear was that apparently they're looking at what things pop up through, through their test and praise test and, and oh, this is coach the buses. travel. Yeah, Hi, coach travel rather than buses. So people getting on a coach. I didn't know people were going on coach trips. That's the last place. I, you know, it's a bit like the hotel well, in California. I, you can book out, but you can't leave. Imagine being on a coach and somebody starts coughing. And you're Aye. somewhere in the middle of the highlands. What are you going to do? Get out and stand on the side of the road in the rain? I'm not sure it's coach tours. Is it not intercity coaches? No, no, it wasn't like that she was talking about. Talking about more about mm. group parties traveling together on coaches. I, I can imagine quite a lot of them by going to Blackpool, just going for a baby. Uh, if anybody wants to do that, Barry, just chuck a chuck a couple of COVID soaked rags in the back of the bus and then let them mount up. If they're stupid enough to do something like that, he'll mend them. Well, yeah, you could just drive them from one hospital to the next mm -hmm. in a coach. I, I was sitting here actually trying to think if there's anywhere even less likely that you'll see me in the near future than a coach. Oh, we didn't I go on can't. A, I'm I saw them. Temperance Society meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Three A's, you mean? Is there, su is, is there such a thing? Um, 12, 12 steps. I, I have to do an observation I had was I think she's looking a wee bit wabbit. I thought she looked a wee bit wabbit today. Right at the beginning, she perked up. But um, I can kind of understand why. The Herald coached its question uh, um, in terms of the pressure she's feeling. She got away with it, asking the question. Oh, she, she did perk up, but she didn't even start on her toes, put it that way. Yeah, she was all right. I, mean, um, mm -hmm. I, I was actually just going to move on, Stuart. Aye, absolutely. You spotted the George Caravan piece in the National today. 
quite a quite a, a, an eye opener. Not what anybody else was talking about this week. Well, he's suggesting that uh, there's a possibility, maybe sort of, kind of, he thinks it might be going through Alex's head. And any other way I can make this sound less of a fact than, than maybe people think it is, uh, that Alex Salmond might come back to lead an indie list party. Yes, I suppose it's worth pointing out that the, both um, the ISP, what are they called, the Independent Scotland Party? They're the ones that are actually registered. They're centre to centre left, and they are actually registered, and they've got a logo. Whereas yeah. the, the Alliance, which has already had to change I the name, AIP. They are. They include solidarity. Uh, so that's a bit of a hmm, rise by another umbrella. That's uh, Tommy Sheridan, who is like you know Marmite. Um, they it uh, ends in eight, but I don't think it's Marmite. <laughs> Very good. And I don't think there was uh, much love lost. But anyway, I read an, I read a, 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 an article by the, the Colette Walker, who's the leader of ISP, talking about explaining why they hadn't yet got together with the AF, uh, AFP. Oh, Denny, Denny. And the, and the SSP, Colin Fox's group. Anyway. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. George Caravan brings them all together. Read, the, read George Caravan's article. He saves you a lot of reading. I it's a lot pie of in them. the sky, man. It's absolute pie in the sky. George must have been in, on the mushrooms to come up with that. As if Colin Fox would even get in the same room with Tommy Sheridan, never mind join in. Well, I was going to well, say, the only one amongst them that I have any respect for uh, is Colin Fox. I mean, he was a good MSP when he had his wee shot. Mm -hmm. And you know exactly what his politics are. And he spends no time ripping other people apart. You know, well, and he Tommy still Sheridan. stands out of the Wellington horse every <laughs> week. Uh, he was he was doing it last Tuesday, mate. It seems to be he seems to have switched to a Tuesday. But Tommy Sheridan ripped apart the left wing of Scottish politics for his ego. Now yeah. he's trying to get in and rip apart the independence movement. I don't know Ken, who's paying his salary, and it can't be about ego. I mean, I know his ego is massive, but it can't be about ego. But AFI are basically Pat Lee. And all Tommy's hangers on for his court case. Tommy's just sitting in the background pulling the strings. So they're a nonsense. They'll get Navia. They might not even get to stand in the election because it seems to me that they couldn't find their arse with two hands and an assistant when it comes to actually getting things organised. They're trying to do it by committee and they are making a pig's lug of it. Um, I didn't, as I say, I thought George's article, all the stuff about Alex Salmond, it's pure conjecture. He's got nothing to base it on. And it was like one of Wing's worst articles when he was kind of wishing that Alex would do the same thing. And he wrote a similar kind of thing months ago. It's like George has just regurgitated that, if you know. I think why I want, I like the article was really just as the way he summed up the situation with the, the other minor parties and brought the, 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 them all together in one article, which I'd been struggling to make sense of. It's, it's at, at the moment, now it might change, but at the moment, they none of them would get my vote. They just, they, they don't look like a, a truly viable option. And they haven't got very long to change that. In terms of politics, they've got about three months, 12 weeks. If it's not done by the end of January, you know? Nothing uh, happens, I Because the, the election's going to go ahead in May, unless something ludicrous happens. The election's going ahead at the start of May, so... And a lot of the people that will be involved in this will be ex-SNP who won't be knocking doors for the SNP. So, uh, even if they don't stand, it could be very dangerous for the SNP's activist base. Yeah, I, pre yeah, yeah, I prefer the, um, I forget the boy's name, but the blog piece that talked about reclaiming the SNP. Um, it's kind of... Are you Lawson? Aye, that's a boy. Aye, he's, you know, talking about removing some of these people on the NEC and 
that was a a very interesting piece. Um, but that's for after the election, really. You've not got time to do that. And the that, candidate well, election thing that's going on at the moment, I agree with. I find it, if you are about to select a candidate for your constituency, for God's sake, do your homework and find out where they stand on, mostly on independence. Make well, sure they work for independence. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be very disappointed if there aren't moves made at this conference. Now, I know it's going to be difficult because it's virtual and nobody mm. is really going to understand at the first one how it works. But moves have to be made. It doesn't actually right. even matter if they're successful or not. They just have to show willing to change. They need to be, they need to be able to shine a big bright light on the NEC and what's been going on in there and yeah. why the Wokarati have found it pretty easy, really, to grasp the centre of the party. Well, as we said yesterday, Stuart, sure, I, I think the path that has allowed them into power on the NEC has been this associate membership stuff. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, well, basically, I, I, I'm finding it difficult finding out who all these uh, members of the NEC are. They're just there for associate to... Yeah, I associate did see a list. Groups. You did, did you? Yeah, it's out there somewhere. Is there an official list or is it somebody else? That, uh, I, I, no, I, I think it's... Somebody I tried to put together, but it, I don't think it was an official list. I think there is an official list somewhere. I shall ask. I've got a new card today, I'll show you. Brand new, not, not that I need it, because I've got an old card, got exactly the same number, and another card with a, a different number, just to confuse them down at SNP HQ. Oh, right. This is your SNP membership card. Yeah, well... I like Why has it got them. a baby on it? <laughs> you lying about your age to them have you got a junior membership shirt? from baby steps to giant steps right, oh, okay. oh gee so whoever thought that up's worse than Dominic Cummins uh, Jimmy you want to have a wee rant about people having a rant aye aye um, I ended up taking myself Twitter at the weekend there uh, gave myself a break because it's indie Twitter over the weekend's a bit of a rabbit hole anyway. It was particularly Ouija indie Twitter once they've been at the Buckfast and the Cooking Cherry. But um, I want to have a pop at people who decided... With apologies to all our Ouija listeners. Aye, aye. Well, you apologise, mate. You came out, I think, Ouija. Sorry, I'm only joking. Um, no, I want to have a pop at everybody that was decide, decided that bar staff over Scotland, who are only happy about being shut again, um, they decided over the weekend that they were all unionists and that dumping the ice was a unionist plot. It was nothing to do with bar staff. Horse shit. It started on a bartender's website, eh, a bartender's bar staff Facebook page. Grew for there. I know a few of the people that went to the Edinburgh protest. Um, they're nothing to do with the union. They're nothing to do with any political parties. They're just raging that they're getting the blame for passing the virus in the country when they're not. And I, I wanted to point out to people as well, you know, 20% of people who uh, are track and trace identifies as positive have been in a bar. Well, 100% of them have been in Tesco or the co-op and they're doing nothing to them. 90% of them have been on a bus. You know well, what I mean? It's only hospitality that are getting it worked up them again. The last, last week. The last statistics I saw biggest incubator, if you like, for the virus was homes. And then on just about level pegging, uh, schools and universities, colleges, and bars. And places and of work. Restaurants. Well, no, I'm not, but no. When the, when the bars the reopened, I'm sorry, but when, the, when hospitality was open, there was no spike in the numbers. It's when schools and universities went back that the numbers started to climb. Um, now, I can't remember the time period for this, but I think it actually, well, it must have been after, obviously, the universities opened. Um, but that was the level. Now, as everybody keeps saying, you can't prove where somebody got it. No, you can't. Um, but it was obviously track and trace saying, right, 
this number of people that said they'd been at universities, whatever. This number no, it was the fun police. Well, you know, I'm a bit like the users restaurants because the fun police didn't go there. The fun suckers, they sit in their house reading books. No, but you've got, look, the First Minister said it herself. She just hadn't said it in, the, in recent weeks. She said it when it was about letting the schools go back and she said it when it was about letting the, the university and college students go back. It's a balancing act. Some, it, although hospitality is not the biggest spreader of, you know, COVID. Um, it's the, the colleges and schools are, and they've decided they are more important than hospitality. And that's why they're opening the hospitality is getting hit. Well, the only reason they, they, let, well, they want students to come back is so that student landlords got their rent. That's why students went back to university so that student landlords got their rent. No other got... reason. They're doing, they're doing bloody stuff online anyway. They could easily have been sat in their house doing it. That's, that is a solid argument. But the schools thing, I mean, if schools don't go back, there's a hit anyway on the economy because mums, mums and dads can't go back full time either. I'm happy for the schools to go back, but who's them doing with anti-COVID anti -COVID <laughs> foam going and coming or something? That would probably work, Jimmy. Anti-COVID foam tunnels. They don't, they, they don't have an, a, a UV light system for uh, disinfecting bars. Have they proved that? I don't know, like Wayne's mate. Look them in the schools for 12 weeks for me. Tell me what I mean. Because yeah, they don't have a tunnel you've got to walk through with UV lights just to disinfect them on the way in and out. So no, that, sounds, that sounds like we're half an E. We might be going down the tunnel ourselves, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jimmy, where, where do you actually stand on this? Do you kind of, are you one of the circle of wagons around care homes and get on with life people? No, because I think that's probably impossible, mate. But I'm definitely of the opinion that chucking bars under the bus isn't the right thing to do. I think people socially distance in bars. They, they certainly socially distance as much as they can in restaurants. And driving about me, I'm looking at <clears throat> an awful lot of businesses that just never reopen for the first time. And we were always told if there was going to be a second lockdown, it would be disastrous. So, so we've chosen to make it disastrous for hospitality in the hope that somehow a miracle happens and the numbers improve in 16 days and they just bloody won't. Well, they won't improve in 16 days. That that won't happen. It will be after that that you see the improvement. But what, well, so what is your position on this? Nothing closes. Everybody see, wears a mask all the time. I didn't see the point of shutting the bars, mate. I don't see the point of the fun suckers doing that to people. Um, and they've decimated our city centres. I mean, I worked Friday and Saturday, sorry, Saturday and Sunday. Waste of time. Absolute waste of time. The only people out are folk that are going to craft fairs and bloody bookshops and looking for a new tie-dyed scarf for their pet dolphin or whatever. Come on, are, you, are you trying to insinuate that this whole city was full of hippies at the weekend? Yeah, I wouldn't have called them hippies, mate. Modern-day hippies are a bit too woke. They're not they're no as much fun as the real hippies. Hippies actually can't out enjoy themselves this lot. The broom's far too far up their farter for them ever to enjoy themselves. So really, well, I'm trying to glean out of you what you think would be an answer to get a, the numbers down. What I think would be an answer to getting the numbers down, I don't think there is one, mate. I think we're just going to have to accept that the numbers are going up this winter. And we hopefully drove it down far enough in the summer that the NHS will cope in a way that it's already failing to cope in England. Um, it won't be overrun, because let's be honest, it wasn't overrun last time, and we're nowhere close to that at the moment. We're meant to have so much more capacity now. But I think we've got to accept that until there's a virus, sorry, a vaccine, which I doubt they'll get to, but they seem adamant they will, people are going to die for this virus. They're dying all over the planet. How do we pos How can we possibly think that we can do better than countries that have actually, from the start, dealt with it better than we have because we had that disastrous start where we were tied to England on every decision. So Germany, there I mean, are massive. 
the numbers in Germany are back up, mate. And that country has chucked way more money out than yeah, the United yeah. Kingdom has. So you basically think COVID's the new flu? No, I don't think it's the new flu. I think it's far more virulent than the flu. No, no, well, but I mean, I mean in the sense that it's going to come around every year at, w at winter time, sort of thing. I think it's entirely possible, mate. Um, no, no, no. I mean, the, the chief medical unless officer... Unless Donald pulls his underpants over his suit and comes up with a cure in the next couple uh, of days, yeah. but I very much doubt that will happen. Jimmy, the chief medical officer supported that point of view when he was asked at the end of the presser there. How did he see it? And he said, well, yes, it's it's going to come back every year. We're never, you know, it's only with treatments and any vaccinations we'll be able to control it, but it, we can't get rid of it, he says. So we better it, hope that you get immunity from it after getting it then. No, I, I think the, most of the studies on immunity would tend to indicate that it's very short term. Um, I had a couple of my taxi this morning, mate, and they both had it in March, and the woman has now developed quite a serious heart condition that they are putting down to the fact COVID smashed about her immune system quite so badly that this condition has managed to develop. I mean, we didn't know. We didn't know enough about what it does. People are talking about long COVID and a COVID tale. A COVID tale sounds to me like a right shite story, but anyway. Um, but we're, we're really only, we're in the infancy of finding what's going on here. But it's certainly, I mean, I've heard it mentioned, I think, about three times in the last week that um, this is eventually just going to turn into normal life. That's yeah. what really kind of what we're talking around. You know, we, we'll have to come just get used to it. But slowly, it's going to be around. It could be, you know, that um, they're, they're getting their uh, euthanasia, their, uh, what's the policy again for getting rid of all the old people? Do not Eugenic. resuscitate. Oh, yeah, but I'm thinking more about the sociological policy that the, the Nazis Eugenics, are. yeah. Eugenics, aye. Um, they'll probably get their own way through this but without even meaning to. Well, I was watching a wee bit of the English pronouncements that are going on throughout the day on Sky News, and that Jonathan Van Tam, kind of wee dapper Chinese chap who's um, deputy chief medical officer in there, he produced a couple of graphics that, frankly, I just didn't believe. Um, and you may know this government, you know, they're far more about spin than substance. But basically, they were saying that the North has to be shut down now because although numbers are going up everywhere, they're go the, in the Northwest and the Northeast, elderly people are getting it. They're being infected in a way that they just aren't in the rest of the country. Now, I'm assuming this is some horseshit that they've dreamt up this morning because the sun pointed out to them that some of the places that are locked down at the moment in the north of England have a rate of cases per 100,000 far lower than, I think there were five Tory grandees whose constituencies they, they showed. Far higher figures, no chance of lockdown because they've got a very influential Tory MP as their MP. Mm. I don't believe what's going on down there at the moment. I well, think that, they will do whatever they like. I mean, I, I think we touched on this again yesterday, Stuart. Sure. That, that's a problem politically because if it becomes sort of commonly accepted that there is a them and us mm. situation, you know, if the general populace, if the man on the uh, Clapham omnibus starts to believe that, Aye, your, your adherence to restrictions is gone. It's out the yeah. Windy. yeah. It, it's and... very odd when you look at all the, the the map, when you see the map of Britain, with a, and it's all in coloured for the intensity of the of the virus, and how the whole southeast of England that votes Tory all the time, is hardly any colour at all. Well, the only area I could find in yesterday's stats that was lower than Scotland um, per million population was the southwest was Cornwall. Everywhere else was higher. Now I know our press tends to look for everything that makes uh, the Scottish government look worse, but if that's statistically accurate, and we're going into a severe lockdown quicker 
than what they're attending for the north of England. And it doesn't work. If our 16 days doesn't work, England are in for a nightmare. Yes. Um, the numbers, th there's already um, certain hospitals that are struggling, mate. There's already, you know, it's the report, as you say, has been pretty poor on it. But I mean, I'm looking, I say looking forward, and that's the wrong expression, but I am looking forward to tomorrow's papers and for the reactions that are. Keir Starmer is still getting challenged because he's still backing Brexit. He's been challenged to say, well, look, hang on, hang on a minute. Things are really, really bad with this virus. We really don't need Brexit as well. We need to have a delay on Brexit just to save people's lives. The, the Tory Brexiteers are rubbing their hands and jumping up and down in glee because no, of this coronavirus. And they're all getting contracts, 100 million for a... A well, hundred pound company they set up last week. Brexit will be blamed for nothing. It will right. all be about the pandemic. It will all be about the pandemic. And in terms of contracts, that was an interesting one yesterday. That um, basically the other three parties in England in the Good Law Project are launching a, a, a legal challenge because of the eleven billion that's been handed out in contracts. And we know some of these are extraordinarily dodgy because we've seen it reported. But of that 11 billion, 3 billion is black. Nothing can be found about what the contract was for, who got the contract. So that's what? That's over a quarter. And that's a massive amount of money when you think about it. 3 billion. We it's 10% of the Scottish budget. We live in a completely corrupt country now. We used to laugh mm -hmm. at the South Americans, but we live in the most corrupt country in the world, possibly. It's got so bad, like uh, Richard Murphy made a very interesting tweet yesterday. As he said, he's accusing the, co the government of this country of being corrupt. Two or three years ago, you'd, they, you'd be taken to court for that, for saying that in public. Now it's so normal. Mm -hmm. You can say what you like because they, they are corrupt. And what's coming down the road now? Uh, well, to say that. Th this for me, and, and, and again, I've said this before, this feels like a tipping point for me. If, if they get away with this, they're going to push, they're going to get, they're going to end up being literally a dictatorship. Yeah, when you see the behaviour of some of them, you know, the, the, there's been a couple of articles recently about Pretty Patel, and she really is a, a creature of the night, that one. She's a horrendous person, and she doesn't care. She smirks smugly when she is causing untold suffering to the poorest and the most vulnerable in our society. She giggles a bit. And seriously, you would not get tired of bouncing her back, her back of that woman's head. No, no. Her You'd latest, her her latest um, awful thing is the attack on the lefty lawyers, immigration lawyers, mm. and... Um, there was a, a response from some English lawyer but how, no, in, the, in the Guardian but just, today. But just, the guy who wrote that totally ignored the entire faculty of advocates in Scotland already written as a complete body, well, a body complaining about people. There is somebody already being attacked in an office, a lawyer, because of what they're saying. Pretty Patel drilled down, as well as saying this three weeks ago, after the... the, the she got accused of threatening lawyers' lives by the way she's talking. She drilled down that at, at last week's con Tory conference and made it even worse. Think about the words you just used. It's a government minister calling lawyers lefty, lefty mm. lawyers. So just that, that to me suggests yeah. there's right-wing lawyers out there. Aye. When, when, did, where, when, did we, when did we start politicising the courts? So we've got some fascists in wigs somewhere. Mm. I know where one or two of them are, right enough. Aye, Chamber Street. But the minute you start doing that with lawyers, that affects your whole system. Aye, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to bust apart the system. Well, they were well you politicise the law courts then. And you have lefty judges and fascist I, I, judges. I'm sorry, guys, but you rewind it all up to the, the highest profile guy is Steve Bannon, who represents that whole causing chaos. 
and hid the money behind them as the Koch brothers. And everybody said that's conspiracy theory. No, it's not. This has been going on for years. Mm, this has nothing to do with the conspiracy theories about world government or anything, but there is some very nasty, very rich people. Fortunately, fortunately, the Koch's will be dead in a couple of years, mate. They're both ancient, aren't they? I but the worry what, is who's who's who takes over their B empire. Well, yeah, it's really. what they leave behind, exactly. Yes, and the infection that they've caused in people's minds and the ownership of the power. Mm. Well, let's hope they don't buy Scotland. Oh, here, look, if you're thinking about winding up, I need to make an apology. No, I mean, okay. yesterday when I mentioned that when we talked about the poll. Yesterday, and I rubbished the poll as it was published. Uh, part of that was bias on my part because I really don't trust Angus Robertson. But the other <laughs> part, the, the other reason why I have an excuse um, it's a surveyation poll. Now, every time I see a poll, the first thing I do is go to the poll company's website to see the detail, the details. So I went to Surveyation's poll site yesterday, six, six stories down, I came against came to the one that said Scotland and about voting intentions. So I looked at it and I thought, oh, yes. And it said only a thousand and odd people were asked. Whereas the press release about the... 2,000 and odd, yeah. It was 2,000 and odd. So I got that wrong. My excuse is that there was the surveyation, their website is awful. They never have a date on their story. Oh, so you looked at the wrong poll. And I looked got all the way. It, it was a poll, a very similar poll, January this year. And it, it, you've got to go all the way right down to the bottom to read, to, and then the small print anything about dates. So that's my excuse. And, uh, any and poll you've done in January this year is no worth the paper. Well, I have to tell you, you will never be selected as a Tory MP. Well, because I've told the truth. Because you apologised and put things right. So that's your political career had it. Uh, my political co career is uh, zero. Anybody got anything slightly more lighthearted? You know, just maybe. Let me have a look at my list. There must have Jimmy, been you're smiling there like you've got something, but you're scared to give us it. It's no lighthearted, <laughs> mate. No. I see that um, Peter Bell has joined the four radical, rebellious SNP MPs attacking the BBC. Waste of words. Uh, there you go. I mean, if if you if you're up to speed with politics, you know not to li listen to the BBC. Look at the face. with a few honourable exceptions, but yeah, there's but so few now it's hardly. The only worth thing it. I can say in that in, in favour of the, that issue is the fact that the National made it their front page, and um, indie fans I noticed going around every now and again, some people say at Asda, if you walk into Asda and there's all the, the paper racks, the same in any supermarket these days, people, people have been moving copies of the National around in front of the Daily Mail. And they're, they do, they, they're, they, as you look behind you, Nori, the National specialise in very good front pages. What a shock. Where did they come from? <laughs> I, they do specialise in good front pages. Um... Because that's all people see when they walk into the supermarket. They don't buy the paper. They just look at the headline. Jimmy. I didn't even look. I didn't even look at the bloody paper rack when I walk into a supermarket, mate. You're going in at the wrong end. The booze is up the other end, Stuart. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember the last time I bought a paper. Magazines, New Statesman, uh, Private Eye, aye, aye, but I can't remember. I've, I've got them all online, like. But I, I don't know if you've mentioned that. Yesterday, guys, but um, when did SNP office bearers or representatives start giving exclusives to the Sun and Rupert Murdoch? Um, she's not in the SNP anymore. No, no, just her. I'm talking about the, the people who are trying to oust Kenny Gibson, the Cunningham. Oh. There was a, a rather nasty piece in the mail that got reprinted in the current and what have you. Um, basically, trying to link Kenny Gibson and bloody everybody. Peter Morell was was chucked in there just as clearly he's the bogeyman du jour. But um, when anybody for the SNP that's, or anybody that's recently been hoyed out the SNP 
that goes running in Murdoch, automatically that tells you that they're a, they're at it, they're a yeah. liar. Yeah, and I've they're uh, basically trying to cover them. But if they're running in Murdoch, they're nothing to do with our movement. I, I I can't I can't agree with you more. Um, that was kind of the point. Ian, what's his name was making? Ian Lawson. He mentioned it, didn't he? About. Mm. Um, people who hadn't been selected yet by the constituency acted like they were. Well, yes. it, it's quite a long piece. It does describe all the things. For example, we seem to have all these people posting videos about themselves saying they're up for the to be selected as a candidate for next May's election for the SNP. And yet um, it used to be that uh, no publicity would, you weren't allowed to, to say you were standing until you'd been vetted and approved. Mm. And, well, I, th I think locally, I, I think it's reasonable that you can do a wee video, a wee bio video, so people know what you stand for and things like that. But these look mean, like campaigns. They right? are campaigns. Particularly from a couple of heavy hitters who contrived to lose seats in the past. But, mm. um, aye, it's all very interesting. I'm sure that... Uh, the conference will prove vastly entertaining and our um, good oh. friend, the new slimline version of Peter Bell, will be front and centre and all that. And hasn't he done well? Oh, geez, oh, eh? he looks like a, he looks 20 years younger. A shadow of his former self. Well done, Peter. Yes, well mm -hmm. done, Peter. Um, well, I think we'll call it a day at that, chaps. Always good to see you, James. Thank you kindly, Norman. Well done getting here, and thank you, Stuart. No problem. Um, Nori, Stuart. Um, thanks for listening, folks, and we'll catch up with you tomorrow. Um, after Boris has, I would imagine, followed Bugger Nicola. Northern England. <laughs> it's only the north. Mm, but hey, what did Tory say? It's only the north. Um, so we'll catch up with you tomorrow, folks. Thanks for listening.